Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Questions and Answers. I am Amjid Muhammad and I've been with you for the last uh, 20 odd minutes or so and I will be with you inshallah for the next 20 minutes or so as well. Uh, the number to call, and uh, I know we had a caller just a few minutes before the break, uh, was asked to call again inshallah. So if it was you, uh, 01274 214299. Now is the time to call. We have plenty of time to take your call. We can chat for several minutes, alhamdulillah, without any rush uh, because we are now at the head of uh, the program uh, uh, today, inshallah. So the number, remember, is 01274 214299. Please do call in. Let's have some live questions. And we have the caller who has called in on 01274 214299. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, young man? Good, alhamdulillah. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you very much. Uh, you've been aware of where have you been? Uh, tried to, I think I tried to call last week, but the then I deleted it society and then you went down by the floor. Right, no problem. Have you been, uh, you, you said you're based in Leicester, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Leicester. Yeah, did you go to the uh, uh, HIFS uh, or Quran competition? I don't like to use that word, but let's just use it with these little speech marks thing at uh, Iqra. You mean the Q factor? Uh, let's use that word, the Q factor, yes. Uh, no. How cool? No, no, I, I, I think it's too, it's too far. Yeah. Oh, is it? Is, where, was it? Was it in? Was it in Leicester? Did they, or was it? Was it in London? I'm not sure. I think I don't know if they've done it in Leicester yet, actually. I don't think it was, was it? Yeah, mm. it was. It was. Where was it in Leicester, uh, Adil? There was a madrasa in Leicester. Well, you need to be a bit specific. There's a lot of madrasas, Adil, in Leicester. <laughs> any particular? Any particular name? What about the street name? Was it not? Okay. Yeah. He says. Uh, I'm just in case you're wondering. Uh, okay, he goes, there was a madrasa in Leicester, my uh, colleague is telling me, uh, young man, uh, but he doesn't recall the name because Mona Asad Saab was dealing with it. Uh, Mona Asad Saab is not in the building, as they say. But anyway, you know, I was asked uh, by my other colleague, Naeem, that, uh, Mufsab, shall I leave a, a pen and pad for you? And I was going to say no, then I remembered you, and I thought, last time he had four questions for me, you never know, he might ring today, and look where you are, mashallah, you have rung today. Do I need my pen and pad, uh, young man? Say. Do I need my pen and pad? Um, uh, yes or no, I think, is the answer you're looking for. Hmm. Go on, then. How many questions have you got? Uh, well, two is for me and one for my sister. One okay. for my relative. Okay, so I do need my pad then, don't I? Because how am I going to remember three questions? Right, number one, number two, and number three. Mm -hmm. Off you go. Give us number one then, please. So number one is um, if you use moisturizer, if you, so if you use moisturizer, can you then can you then do a book? Okay. Uh, we'll do it. number two. Number two is who are the bandies or the bandies? Who are the Dio bandies? Oh. And are they part of Ashna Sunnah al Jama? <laughs> Oh, man. Where did you pull that question out of? Um, Number three. Is that from your cousin? Which one is from your cousin? I'm just interested. The first one. The first one is from your cousin. Okay. And that, one's, and that one's from you, number two? Yeah. What have you been reading? Yeah, number three. Um, so, so you know how the Sahaba was separated into two means? Is it the Ampar and the Mahajirun? That's right. So what was the people who asked? Who accepted Islam after Fatah Muska? Which group did they come under? Oh, what did they come under? Yeah. Okay, no problem. Jazak Munakhain, it's a very interesting question. Number three is not homework, is it from Madrasa? No. Okay, just checking, just checking. Jazak Munakhain, young man. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Excellent. So we broke our duck. Young man broke the duck for us. We didn't have to wait till Friday for a call. We got our call on our first day, first time of asking, may Allah reward our young student all the way in Leicester. Ameen. And may his talab for ilm continue. And may he be a top alim of deen doing khidma in Leicester and beyond. Okay, so that he reaches all the way up north here in Bradford as well. Ameen. 
He has three questions. But whilst before I delve into the questions, if you do have any questions, please do call. Now is the time. We do have about a quarter of an hour before we go off air. So I can easily take a few more calls. 01274 214299. Let's deal with the questions then. Let's do the nice and easy one. I like the way he gave me the, a nice easy one to start off with. Putting on moisturizer and then what happens when you perform wudu? Now, as you know, when you put moisturizer on, usually moisturizer moistens the skin. The skin, which is the surface layer on our body, it absorbs, obviously, the moisture uh, or the moisturizer and it goes into the skin. However, some, obviously, depending how much moisturizer we put on, can form a layer on the face. So when we're making wudu, uh, which is making sure that water reaches all the skin, obviously, from the uh, hairline at the top. <laughs> and if it's receding, we don't go by that hairline. It's just where the original hairline was. Uh, to just beneath the chin, when you feel that little kind of uh, little bone. And from the side, it's not the earlobe. I always forget what this thing is called. Uh, from there across to there, this little thing here, which stops things falling inside your ear. Not that things should be falling inside your ear. So that is the face. Uh, waj, as it's referred to in Arabic. And this is what the Quran says, Farsilu wuju hakum, wash your faces. So we have to wash our faces. That does not mean that we have more than one face because obviously it's in the plural, it's addressing the ummah. But what happens if you have a layer of something on the skin? Now, arguably, the water won't reach that. However, with moisturizer, because it's so easily washed away or washable, if you were to put one, uh, I don't know what you call this, um, palmfuls of water uh, onto your face, then naturally, as you rub your hands down your face, the, the moisturizer will disappear if it's not already been absorbed by your skin. It will come off very quickly. Okay, and by the time you're putting the second one on, it's now touching skin. So you won't have any problem with that with regards to wudu. Okay, that's that one. Next one is the Ansar and the Muhajirun. And then I'll come back to question number two, because question number two is a more detailed one. Ansar and Muhajirun. As the young man said, that Islam in its very early stages, immediately after Hijrah, the Muslims were split, not necessarily split into two, but they uh, came from different places. So those that had come from Mecca were called the Muhajirun. Okay, not sure why I'm writing it down here. And those who had come from Medina, okay, were called the Ansar. So those who came from Mecca, because obviously the Muslims travelled from Mecca to Medina, they made Hijrah. And if you look at the root letters of Hijrah, it's Hajara. Okay, Ha, as in Ha, Jara, Hijrah. And if you look at Muhajirun, Muhajirun, Hajara is in there as well. So a Muhajir is somebody who makes Hijrah. Muhajirun is the plural. Like Muslimun, Muslim is the singular, Muslimun is the plural. Okay, so a Muhajir or Muhajirun are those who made migration, migrated, emigrated. So where did they leave? They left Mecca. Where did they go? They went to Medina. So the people who moved were called the Muhajirun. When they arrived, there were Muslims there. The Muhajirun didn't take anything with them or hardly anything with them, just what they could fit on a camel's back. And if they were sat on the camel's back, then there's not much room for anything else. So they didn't really take anything with them, nothing with them whatsoever, hardly anything. So when they arrived in Medina, they didn't have a house. They might have had an animal. They didn't have an occupation. They didn't have any land. They hardly had any money because they rush out. So they were tended to be poor. Now, it's near impossible as you know, we see a lot of uh, migra migrants coming now uh, to the UK and coming to Europe uh, because of the wars which are in the Middle East and Asia. So the people are en masse moving towards Europe. And they are migrants, usually economic migrants. So when they come, they come in nothing. So obviously it is the responsibility of the community in the country to support them and integrate them into society. So in the same way, when the Muhajirun Muslims went from Mecca to Medina, it was the Muslims of Medina's responsibility to integrate the Muslims from Mecca. 
and they were referred to as the Ansar. Why Ansar? Because let's look at the root letters of Ansar. Noon, Saad, Ra, Ansar. Noon, Saad, Ra, Nasir, Nasara, Yansuru, Nasirun, Unsur, La Tansur. What is that? To help. So they are the helpers. They are the migrants and they are the helpers. That's the, that's, it was just a practical explanation, a practical definition, a practical identifier. Nothing fancy, not mentioning anything, just practically who they were. So the Ansar supported the Muhajirun. They were set up in such a way that one Muhajir was with one from the Ansar. And Ukhuwiya, brotherhood, was set up. So they could support one another. Within a very short space of time, the Muhajirun became independent from the Ansar. Alhamdulillah. They were hardworking people. They were businessmen. And they were good businessmen. So within a few years, they managed to make enough money to get themselves a property or rent a property or to, you know, earn some money. And they started to look after themselves. Therefore, you can already see that the division of Ansar and Muhajirun was slowly disappearing. By the time Fath Makkah takes place now, there is victory, meaning Muslims can now travel across the whole Arabian Peninsula with no fear or no worry. Why? Because the dominant power base, which was the Arab tribes associated with those within Makkah, had gone. The religion of the pagans, the polytheistic religion had disappeared. It no longer existed anymore. It was now a case that Islam could flourish without the intervention and the blocking and the stopping and the wars that the mushriks of Mecca had waged against the Prophet ﷺ. So therefore there was no further division required. So there's no need to, there were just Muslims now because there's no migration, there's no support. Okay. La hijra ba'd al fath. Okay. There is no hijra after the fath, after the victory. Okay. No hijra after the victory. So that is those three questions, or two questions. One more question was asked, and that was who or what are the Diobandis, and do they come under Ahle Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Diobandi is a place in India. Okay, it's a place in India and it is a Darul Uloom. It is a Darul Uloom which takes academic studies very seriously. So it teaches from very basic kitabs to learn Arabic, learn Urdu and then go into the sciences of falsafa, of ashar, ash poetry, to go into kalam. Theology, Aqeedah, Fiqh, Tajweed, Hadith, Tafsir, Usul, you know, all the various branches of sciences that we have to study when we enter a madrasa. On top of that, they have a lot of work that they do on what's called Islahun Nafs, which is to rectify the Nafs, to work on the... Uh, spirituality of a person to make sure that yeah they do certain work but are you doing it sincerely okay what's your intention for doing this work that is really what the basis and it came about in uh, the 19th century um, around the time when the British Raj was still in India and it was there to continue to educate from the, uh, what was called Dioban, other madrasas were set up in the Indian subcontinent. Whenever students graduated from that madrasa, they went elsewhere, they studied there, they went elsewhere. So when they went back to their hometowns or their home villages, they set one up themselves then and they started to gather students around them. Same thing happened here in the UK. We had teachers coming over in the 50s and 60s into the UK. So when they arrived here, they also recognized the need for ensuring 
that there it should be Darul Ulooms here in the UK. And this didn't just happen in the UK, it's happened in Canada, America, Portugal, France, Italy, whatever. So they set up a Darul Ulooms here using the same methodology, same teaching style, same Islah al Nafs. And we had those set up in this country. So, you know, whether it's in Berry, Dewsbury, Batley, Bradford, Blackburn, Leicester, okay, Birmingham, London, all over the UK, Darul Ulooms, Islamic schools, uh, madrasas were set up with the same methodology as Darul Ulum Dioband. So that's what Dioband is and that's what Diobandis are. And do they come under Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Well, yes, because they are Hanafi by fiqh and they are Maturidi by Aqeedah. And the Maturidi and the Ash'ari are all come under the banner of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah because their methodology is the same. That is to follow the practices of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam wal Jama'ah us Sahaba and the congregation and the, uh, the uh, agreement, the uh, coming together of the companions radiallahu anhum ajma'in so that hopefully answers those three questions okay we didn't get any calls um, and now it is pretty late in the evening for a call i think you might just squeeze one in if you were to call in the next 30 seconds you would be able to squeeze in so i will share the number with you 01274 214299 that's 01274 214299. If you do call in the next 30 seconds, we will be able to take your call, inshallah, and answer your question. If, on the other hand, you do not call in in the next 30 seconds, then I would say wait and inshallah ring tomorrow because we will be here tomorrow, same time, same place, uh, with our Dekora um, TV questions and answers. If, on the other hand, you wish to email, then you would have seen throughout today's show. And also, uh, over the last week or so, and for the foreseeable future, till at least the beginning of the new year, you will see the email address, which will give you a direct email to my inbox, uh, which is amjad.muhammad, A-M-J-A-D dot M-O-H-A-M-M-E-D at al khair A-L-K-H-A-I-R dot org. And I'll just take a quick look. Uh, to see if any emails have come in um, and um, I cannot see any that have come in the Al Khair box no there isn't so therefore um, we won't be taking any questions from there I will see if there's any questions that have come through on here um, there are a few questions on the ladies group I will see if I can answer at least one here we go Assalamu Alaikum Mufsab I pray all is well when prescribed with a medication, do I have to first read the ingredients and make sure it, if it has any haram ingredients? I don't understand most of the names and it's very difficult to research about each and every ingredient. Also, is there a list of common haram ingredients used in medicine that we need to watch out for? Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, all is well. I pray likewise for you and your loved ones. I mean, it's very straightforward, sister. The, uh, you need to look to see if it contains any animal additives, okay? Anything that has been derived from animals, that is impermissible. And the second thing is to see if there are any alcohol. And when we speak of alcohol, we're speaking of either labeled as ethyl alcohol or ethanol. But when we do look at alcohol, we are looking for alcohol that has been produced via dates or grapes. Uh, meaning it is uh, natural alcohol rather than something which has been synthesized in a laboratory. Most medicines, uh, I suspect, will be those that have been synthesized in a laboratory. So really, that's all you need to ask. And even simpler, your GP should know that you are a Muslim. That If they don't know that, then something's gone wrong. And you should have shared it to them right from the beginning, what it is that a Muslim can consume or cannot consume. That would mean that your GP would always ensure that they only prescribe medicines which you can take unless there are exceptional circumstances. And in exceptional circumstances, there are times when we give exceptional fatwas. So that, my dear brothers and sisters, brings us to the end of today's show. Please join me again tomorrow, same time, same place, with more questions and answers, and hopefully some more phone calls as well. Till tomorrow. 
السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ